The Lord be with you. And also with you. Our responsive call to worship. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. Here the righteous may enter. I give thanks to you, for you have answered me, and you have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. By the Lord has this been done. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it.
Let us pray. Holy and almighty God, as we gather in awe of your goodness, mercy, and love today, we invite you to be here among us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, as we begin this inauguration and installation service of our eighth president of Princeton Theological Seminary, may your presence fill this space and prepare our hearts, minds, and bodies to be embraced by you. Thank you, God, for the gifts you have provided for this worshiping and learning community. Thank you, Jesus, for the abundant supply of your truth, wisdom, and beauty to which we draw our strength and purpose in our calling. Lead us in joy and celebration of the only reality worth knowing, that you love us and call us to be your beloved. May the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing to you. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. A reading from Isaiah, the sixth chapter, verses one through eight. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called and the house filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me. I am lost for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips, yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. Here ends the reading.
A reading from 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verses 12 through 24. But we appeal to you, brothers and sisters, to respect those who labor among you and have charge of you in the Lord and admonish you. Esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, to admonish the idlers, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all of them. See that none of you repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Here ends the reading.
members of the faculty and administration and distinguished guests and students, on behalf of the Board of Trustees, I welcome you to the inauguration installation of the Reverend, Reverend Dr. Jonathan Lee Walton as the eighth president of Princeton Theological Seminary. and as a professor of religion and society in the theology department. Following today's service, all of you are cordially invited to a reception for President and Mrs. Walton hosted by the PTS class of 2002 in the <laughs> in the atrium of the Theodore Sedgwick Wright Library. I now welcome the Reverend Ruth Santana Grace and Reverend Siobhan Sterling Lewis, co-moderators of the 225th General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church USA, who are here participating in this service of inauguration and installation. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am the Reverend Siobhan Starling Lewis, here with my holy possibility sister, Reverend Ruth Faith Santana Grace, as GA moderators to bring greetings on behalf of the bold commissioners and advisory delegates of the 225th General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church USA, and as ambassadors for the 1.1 members, 1.1 million members of the PCUSA, Isaiah 3419 says, I am about to do a new thing. <laughs> now it springs forth, do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. We thank God for the new thing that is this moment. Amen? Amen. We are blessed to bear communal love and joyful excitement as Princeton Theological Seminary inaugurates its eighth president, Reverend Dr. Jonathan Lee Walton. What a, what a bold and historic moment. I also welcome you, Jonathan Lee Walton, as the eighth president of Princeton Theological Seminary, you have been called to serve this beloved place for a time such as this, a time when the church is wrestling with finding a way forward that is faithful and relevant for today, a time when how we prepare our leaders must reflect our current realities. Mm. We will be blessed yes. by your love of the gospel, your heart for students, your understanding of the intersection of our faith in this cultural realm. So lead with prayer, purpose, and possibility. It is a privilege to stand in this place with you on this day. Mi amigo, mi hermano, mi presidente. May God bless you. Press on. Amen. Thank you, Ruth, Reverend Santana Grace, and thank you, Reverend Starling Lewis. Pursuant to the action by the trustees, Board of Trustees of Princeton Theological Seminary and the reception by the 226th General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church, I now call upon the Reverend Dr. Jonathan Lee Walton for his subscription and formula of office. The Board of Trustees, responsive to the purpose and mission of the seminary, as authorized under the Certificate of Incorporation and Bylaws of the Corporation, specifies that every person elected to the presidency and faculty of the institution 
answer affirmatively the following questions. Do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And do you confess anew the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, and acknowledge him head over all things to the church, which is his body? I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the Church Catholic, and by the Holy Spirit, God's word to you? I do. Will you perform the duties of president of the seminary in obedience to Jesus Christ under the, the authority of the scriptures? I will, so help me God. Have you been induced, as far as you know, in your own heart to accept the call of the office into which you are now being inducted with a sincere desire to promote the glory of God in the gospel of his son? I have. And are you willing to undertake the work of president and professor in this seminary? And do you promise to discharge the duties which are incumbent upon you in this character, as God shall give you strength? Absolutely. <laughs> Amen. Dr. Walton, I invite you now to inscribe your signature in the official register of Princeton Theological Seminary, joining your name to those of your faculty predecessors and colleagues. Dr. Walton, whereas you have answered in the affirmative the questions requisite of your office, I now declare in the presence of these witnesses that you, Jonathan Lee Walton, are duly inaugurated and installed as the president of Princeton Theological Seminary. Let us pray. Faithful God of ages past, living God stirring among us now, exuberant God of futures yet unseen, we lift our hearts to praise you for the 211 year history of Princeton Theological Seminary. By your Holy Spirit, you have joined together through common bonds of faith and prayer generations of able and visionary presidents, trustees, administrators, staff, faculty, and students. We give thanks for your gracious blessing and guidance of this seminary in its mission to educate and train learned and faithful pastors, teachers, leaders, and activists to serve you, your church, and the world that you love. Grateful for what the seminary has done well, we also confess before you the seminary's faults and failings in its history. Renewing spirit, continue to create in us and in our institution a new heart again and again that we may more authentically follow you and serve you with grace and mercy, justice and joy. We celebrate, O oh God, your gift of rich diversity in the seminary's life. Diversities racial, ethnic and gender, diversities of denomination and faith tradition, diversities of region and nation, of ability and age, diversities of interest and passion 
all held together and anchored by our shared faith, commitment, and worship of you, O God, our help in ages past, and our hope for years to come. We offer to you our special thanksgiving for this day, a day that you, O Lord, have made, a day in which we rejoice and are glad. On this occasion of the inauguration of the Reverend Dr. Jonathan Walton as the eighth president of Princeton Seminary. Pour out, we pray, your Holy Spirit upon President Walton, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence. Encourage, sustain, and guide him in the years ahead through all the joys and burdens of leadership. Healing God, we pray for the many places in the world that are wounded by conflict and inequality, suffering and pain, loneliness and despair. In the face of the world's deep needs, bless President Walton in his efforts to lead our seminary into new possibilities for mission, new ventures that are both faithful and bold, new modes of teaching that reach out and serve new communities of learners. We ask all these things in order that Princeton Seminary might more effectively proclaim your name and equip its students more faithfully to do what you require of us, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you, our God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. First, just a, a brief personal word, Jonathan. I absolutely delight in your call to serve as the seminary's eighth president, as I know does President Emeritus Ian Torrance, who is here with us, the seminary's sixth president. And I think we're it in terms of living predecessors. <laughs> it's not an easy job. And Dawn and I very much wish you and Cecily as much joy in serving the seminary community as we certainly did during our season of service. Now to the charge for the new president. In ancient Israel, the process of finding a new king was quite a bit messier than our careful procedure for choosing a new seminary president. When King David died, Adonijah was the oldest living prince, so many, including Adonijah, thought he should be the next king. But David had promised the throne to Solomon, the son of Bathsheba. And the people were split between these two candidates. For a while, there was a good bit of lobbying, politics, and intrigue, nothing that we haven't seen in our own <laughs> political system. But then the story gets biblical. Solomon had Adonijah killed, which pretty much made it clear who the next king would be. This meant that the great King Solomon began his reign by killing his half-brother. Now, Maybe that's not what you thought I meant by saying now the story gets biblical. That's exactly what I meant. <laughs> One of the many reasons I love the Bible is that it refuses to sanitize its characters. 
It is filled with real people who have a really hard time discerning the right, much less doing it. Most of the time, like us, the biblical characters are not all good or all bad. We too are a confusing mess of good intentions and bad ideas about how to make our dreams come true. Solomon was no different. He really wanted to be king and was willing to do whatever it took to achieve that goal. That's how he got blood on his hands, doing whatever it takes to meet a goal. Leadership is not easy in any field, including leading a seminary of the church. The hardest part is not the long hours and the countless texts and emails and meetings and the endless petitions. The hardest part is not the often conflicting agendas of students, faculty, administrators, trustees, donors, and alumni. Nor is the hardest part even navigating what eventually feels like the next crisis du jour. The hardest part, President Walton, is that in the end, you are the one forced to make difficult choices and you don't always know the right choice to make. If leadership is an art, it is a confusing and messy one. And often it's the leader's own soul that is most confused. We hurt at having to hurt those we inevitably disappoint. We feel compromised by the systems we lead, which have to be self-interested. We miss the days of being able to freely wonder out loud. And we feel acutely the demands of speaking not for ourselves, but for a tradition that's over 200 years old. And we wonder if our choices are really what God had in mind. And God save us from all leaders who are too self-certain or too ideologically captured to feel this lonely confusion in their souls at the end of another long day of faithful service. Not long after Solomon's coronation, the Lord appeared to him in a dream. And the Lord asked Solomon, what shall I give you? An amazing question to ask a leader. When leaders are interviewed about their dream job, they often respond by saying things like, you know, I always dream about being a baker or a gardener, or the person who sits alone in the fire tower out in the forest. But that's, that's always just the fatigue talking. If God comes to you in your dreams, I can promise you it will not be to get you out of your calling. So and perhaps his finest moment. Solomon responds to God's question, what can I do for you? By first acknowledging that he is in over his head. Then he says, give your servant an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. 
there it is. That is what we most need from all of our leaders. We need them to be wise, able to discern between good and evil. This means we do not need our leaders always to have the right plan. Sometimes leadership is wonderfully demonstrated by confessing failure and mistakes. We do not need our leaders to make us happy. Sometimes leaders appeal to that which is noble within us and call for sacrifice. We do not need our leaders to always be strong. The Third Reich, the Khmer Rouge, the KKK, the terror cells, all have been built by strong leaders. But strong leadership in the wrong direction is a disaster. But the wise leader, who can discern between good and evil, is an answer to our prayers. President Walton, you are being in installed as our seminary president in a day in which the people in Ukraine are caught in a long impasse of violence with Russia's invading army, and the people of Israel and Gaza are at the beginning of a terrifying war, and no one knows how far and devastating this conflict will become, but there is already plenty of blood on everyone's hands. And at every sector of society, certainly in our schools of higher education, people are looking to their leaders to offer wisdom, wisdom for the living of these violent days. According to the Bible, the wise leader shifts through the complexity of mixed motives, including the mixed motives of the leader, with the complex goal of not only discerning the good from the evil, but doing it. Now, calling people to the good may not, no, will not, always be popular. And it will inevitably involve conflict with those who have a very different idea of the good. But most of the conflicts Jesus had were frankly conflicts he started. He could have left well enough alone, but the people's insistence on their righteousness exposed souls that were not well enough, so he just kept exposing our conflicts with the grace of God. And along the way, he kept telling us how to find our way towards the just, peaceable, very good reign of God on earth. Through the Holy Spirit, this ascended Savior is not nearly done working on earth and is not nearly done working at Princeton Theological Seminary. So I encourage you to answer God's question, what can I do for you, with a question of your own, which is the question, well, what is Jesus doing? What is Jesus doing here? What is Jesus doing in the world? What is Jesus doing today? If you do not begin your day asking that question, every day will be another temptation to take over for Jesus. And I want to remind you that the job description for Savior has already been filled. <laughs> if you try to become the seminary Savior, 
It will not end well for the seminary or for you. Let Jesus be Jesus. And you can be the bold and faithful witness to what the good unfolding of salvation looks like today. The answer to discovering what it is that Jesus is about in your life and in the seminary community and in the world around it will not put you on an easier or less costly path than Jesus walked. It will cost a lot to pursue the good in the name of Christ. For President Walton, that has always been the Christian's only path to wisdom. Amen. I am honored to stand before you on this signal day and to play a part in celebrating the installation of Jonathan Lee Walton as the eighth president of Princeton Theological Seminary. It was my great privilege to work closely with Jonathan at Harvard for seven years, so I know well the strength of his courage, the depth of his faith, and the power of his voice as well as the value of his friendship. He is a leader of great accomplishment and great promise, and it is a joy to join in honoring him. We have gathered here in solidarity. Like a congregation at a wedding, we signify by our presence our pledge of support to this marriage of a new president to a venerable institution. But our presence and our solidarity represent a great deal more. As we observe this rite of passage for Princeton Seminary, we celebrate both the old and the new. Our very robes represent the long heritage of learning, service, and faith that has defined Princeton Seminary and that links it to ancient traditions of scholarship. In the enactment of this ritual today, we affirm our ties to the values of that past, to the commitment to deep inquiry, to what you have called solid learning. We affirm purposes that are not shaped by the immediate demands of an often myopic present. We affirm a long view that readily recognizes how distant and indeed biblical times have meaning for our own. Even as a professional school training people of faith for roles and jobs in an everyday world, Princeton Seminary asks its community to transcend the immediate, to seek the larger understanding that comes from melding the past and present through the insights of history and tradition. This is a day to recognize and honor Princeton Seminary's distinguished past. But it also marks a new beginning, a new chapter, a new future for this institution. In its work on the seminary's historic ties to slavery, the community has recently recognized the imperative of distinguishing between traditions that are valued and must be perpetuated and other legacies that must be exposed, disowned, and repaired. A ritual like today's representing a defining moment of both history and renewal urges us to look both backward and forward. It requires a clear-eyed assessment of the relationship between past and future, a deep-seated examination of how best to seize the possibilities inherent in this moment of change and rebirth. It is hard even for me 
a historian of the American Civil War, to imagine that any previous president has been inaugurated at a time of greater crisis and upheaval. In little more than just the past week, the American government has descended into chaos with a leaderless House of Representatives. A shocking and cruel war has enveloped and in many cases ended the lives of civilians who have been taken hostage, bombed, terrorized, and killed. Recent torrential rains here, not to mention fires in Canada and melting ice in the Arctic, remind us that climate change presents an existential threat to planet Earth. And in our own realm of education, threats seem existential as well. States and communities across the country are requiring schools and libraries to ban books. The truth of our history is being defined as too uncomfortable to tell. These realities would have seemed unimaginable even a few years ago. Banning books in America in the 21st century? Wildfires darkening our skies for days? Waves washing through New York subway stations? An 85-year-old Holocaust survivor driven off in a golf cart at gunpoint as a hostage? I certainly don't want to impose the burden for fixing all of this on my friend, your new president. <laughs> Nor do I want to make it the sole responsibility of Princeton Seminary, or even of all of us assembled here. But I think this institution has a special role to play in its dual commitment to knowledge and learning and to the ethical values it embraces as its purpose. Yours is an education devoted not to the personal gain or success of an individual, but to the larger good. It regards scholarship and service as inseparable. Your new president has written, and I quote him, intellect is never divorced from moral character. In this week of such profound tragedy, let me invoke the notion in Jewish theology of repairing the world. We need the scholarship, the conviction, the courage, and the wisdom that you cite in your mission statement, perhaps not just to, prepare, to repair the world, but indeed, even more urgently, to save it. You here at the seminary understand the long history of humankind's terrible failures and injustices. And you understand the best of humanity as well. You know the meaning of faith and hope. In this moment of change and possibility for Princeton Seminary, in this moment of need and tragedy in the world, how do you confront the future? What will you do to ensure there is a future for the principles that animate this institution? How will you use the assets of your traditions, your libraries, your faculty, your students, and this dynamic new president to speak and to act for justice, for truth, for compassion, and for peace. As we face a new and frightening era in the world, we today mark a new era at Princeton Seminary. May it be a time when learning illuminates truth, knowledge confronts injustice, and wisdom forges a path towards peace an education grounded in faith and compassion has never been needed more. Thank you.
Good afternoon. On behalf of Princeton University, I am delighted to welcome you all here today. And I am especially delighted to welcome Dr. Jonathan Lee Walton on the occasion of his inauguration as the eighth president of the Princeton Theological Seminary. Today's audience includes delegates from dozens of academic and religious institutions, students, alumni, faculty, and staff from the seminary and the university, and members of scholarly and faith communities from around the world. I join this diverse and distinguished group in extending heartfelt congratulations and joyous support to President Walton on this glorious autumn afternoon. The university and the seminary are more than just neighbors. Indeed, the ties between our two institutions are historic and strong. The founders of the university, then known as the College of New Jersey, were Presbyterian pastors who intended to create both a seminary and a liberal arts college that would be open to students of all religious denominations. As our young nation expanded beyond the original colonies, a need for greater numbers of clergy with specialized training in theology led to the establishment in 1812 of the Princeton Theological Seminary just down the road. From the beginning, the Presbyterian founders recognized that a cooperative, collaborative relationship between the new seminary and the college that would become Princeton University would be to the ongoing benefit of both institutions. The author and theologian Hugh Thompson Kerr, writing in the Princeton Seminary Bulletin, noted that in the seminary's early years, Relations between college and seminary were not only polite but friendly, and a vigorous two-way traffic enlivened and enriched both institutions. There was amicable and continuing interchange among trustees, faculty, and students. For their part, college personnel at all levels and in considerable numbers moved freely and readily across the street to visit and study on the seminary campus. This reciprocity marked the continuing development of both institutions. Dr. Walton and I even share in common one presidential predecessor, Francis Patton, who was the 12th president of Princeton University and the first president of the Princeton Theological Seminary. While the seminary and the university have distinct missions at the core of both institutions, is a commitment to examining questions that help us understand, support, and strengthen our society. These shared goals are especially important today when religious freedom is at risk throughout the world and when society wrestles with urgent questions about what it means to be human in an era of rapid and sometimes overwhelming technological change. I am proud of the history of civic and intellectual partnership between our institutions, and I am honored to participate in today's inauguration. President Walton, you have my warmest congratulations and my best wishes as you begin your presidency. I look forward to many more years of colleagueship and meaningful collaborations between our institutions. On behalf of Princeton University, as your neighbor and friend, welcome.
breaks my heart so that I may be used by thee, for I'm not
A reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, verses 15 through 24. One of the dinner guests, on hearing this, said to him, Blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said to him, Someone gave a great dinner and invited many. At the time of the dinner, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of land, and I must go out and see it. Please accept my regrets. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to try them out. Please accept my regrets. Another said, I've just been married, and therefore I cannot come. So the slave returned and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and said to his slave, go out at once into the streets and lanes of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the slave said, sir, what you have ordered has been done, and there is still room. Then the master said to the slave, go out into the, route, to the roads and lanes and compel people to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those who were invited will taste my dinner. The Gospel of the Lord. How is this? <laughs> to the dedicated trustees, distinguished faculty, devoted staff, and spiritually driven students of Princeton Theological Seminary, I stand before you today overflowing with gratitude and humbled by this appointment. There is indeed a credo that courses through our campus and learning community. Everyone fans the flame of Christian formation. From the front lines of faculty scholarship to the often hidden hands of our facilities, grounds, and food service crews. As we bask in this beautiful pageantry of pomp and circumstance, may I never forget the sacred, humble obligation of this office. Hands that serve are holier than lips that preach and pray. And in this installation ritual, I thank God for all of you. With open arms, we embrace the academic delegates and ecclesiastical ambassadors gathered with us. A special salute to our Princeton University neighbors, represented resplendently by President Christopher Eisengruber, and the many others who are here who serve this incredible university. The fourth president of Princeton Seminary, Dr. James I. McCord, he declared on the day of his inauguration in 1960 that the best theological education is carried out in partnership with a university, lest the seminary become, in his words, little more than a hothouse where piety becomes a substitute for honest intellectual endeavor. May we, 
May we continue cultivating this precious partnership for the good of both institutions, and most importantly, toward the enrichment of this magical town of Princeton that we're both blessed to call home. Finally, with a heart overflowing with appreciation, I salute my sacred circle of family and friends who have traveled here to celebrate this occasion. Many years ago, Cecily and I left with my parents and a U-Haul in tow. The extra load was filled with so much more than secondhand furniture. It contained the collective wisdom and encouragement of Christian communities from Jeffersonville, Indiana, Houston, Atlanta, and Raleigh, North Carolina. My mother and late father deposited us as newlyweds onto this campus. And Princeton Seminary has indeed been for us what it's been for so many, a learning community for life. A place where the dividing lines between friendship and family evaporate. A place where for the first seven years of our marriage, we grew up and we matured together. And today, as I look upon the face of Cecily and our children, Zora Neale, Elijah Mays, and Baldwin Klein, I find myself singing with both Gladys Knight and James Cleveland. Well. <laughs> if anyone should ever write my life story. You'll be there between each line of pain and glory because you're indeed the best thing that's ever happened to me. <laughs> Prayer, purpose, and the expanding table of possibility We've heard the gospel parable read by our SGA moderator. Prayer, purpose, and the expanding table of possibility. My friends, narratives of decline have long shaped the landscape of American religious life. From the Puritans and their political Jeremiads to 19th century sages sounding the siren on our capitalist conceits. Tales of societal slippage are a central feature of American lore. Nevertheless, we ought to be wary of the bedrocks of declension stories. Built on blurred memories and burnished myths, narratives of decline nod less to a nuanced past and oftentimes more to the present privilege of the narrators. Consider the narrative of mainline church decline. For decades, this storyline has constituted its own veritable liturgy of loss and lament a mournful pastoral monologue from a select class of pulpits. But what is this hand-wringing really all about? The very idea of mainline Protestantism merits scrutiny. Some have defined mainline Protestants as the seven sisters of American Protestantism, which includes denominations like the Presbyterian Church USA and the Episcopal Church. Yet why is it mainline? The definition has never been based on numerical strength. More conservative Protestant denominations like the Southern Baptists have always been more populous. Therefore, others define mainline according to shared theological views. They associate mainline with the progressive side of the modernist fundamentalist debates stretching back to the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Yet this is historically inaccurate, anachronistic, and racially exclusive. 
The term mainline Protestantism did not enter our popular vocabulary until after 1960. This was the year when a New York Times journalist first used the qualifier mainline to describe the denominations of conservative wealthy laymen who objected to hearing social, economic, and political pronouncements from the pulpit. That this journalist, however, attached the term mainline to describe a wealthy and powerful contingent within the church would not have surprised readers at the time. For the term mainline was already associated with the suburbs of Philadelphia, where railroad executives commuted into the city along the main line from the wealthy outlying neighborhoods. The Philadelphia Inquirer's weekly column, The Main Liner, even reported on Philadelphia socialites on each Sunday evening. In other words, what I'm saying is the category of the Protestant Main Line emerged more as a cultural and class signifier than a summary of shared theological commitments. This may explain why the concept has never been hospitable to heterogeneity. Denominations like African Methodist Episcopal, despite their ecumenism, never make the cut. Nor are historically black Christian institutions of learning, such as Morehouse or Spelman College, ever considered mainline. And the most common survey mechanisms by institutions such as Pew bracket out black Protestants and establish the categories of Asian American evangelicals and evangelical Protestant Hispanics, despite these groups having diverse theological and political commitments that are more consistent with what has been associated with this presumed main line. Similar is true of Christian immigrants coming from non-Christian nations. They are often photoshopped out of the mainline Protestant frame altogether, even when they're part of one of the seven sister denominations. So what some have come to call mainline decline, sociologists like R. Stephen Warner famously refer to as the de-Europeanization of Christianity. In sum, my friends, the presumed Protestant high moment of the 1950s, a historical reverie reinforced by Cold War conformity, it's over, but it's not owed an elegy. If this so-called decline denotes the dilution of an antiquated cultural aristocracy, then let us not lament. Such a conceptual shift should summon our sorrow, not summon our sorrow, but it should stir our spirits. It does not mark an ending, but it heralds a hopeful, heartening beginning. We must learn from our Christian siblings across the globe and those here domestically, Christians who've always answered the call from the social margins. This frees us to imagine a future where Christian communities need not be fetid to fetishize social hierarchies. Think of Christian moral architects like abolitionist Elijah Parrish Lovejoy. Liberation theologians, Prathia Hall, Ruben Alves, and the grand traditions of Christian response that they represent. These particular Princeton Seminary alums leaven the faith with their alternative visions unencumbered by an essentialized past. Nor should we forget the showers of stoles who were suppressed but refused to remain silent over sexual expression. Such courage from the margins has helped the global church revisit and revise our guest lists. In Luke's gospel, we meet one such fellow traveler a banquet host with an increasingly empty table. 
At some point, an invitation from this man's table was a coveted trophy. This appears to be no longer the case. Thus, the critical question that this host had to ask himself is not simply whether he should invite others to dine, but he had to ask a more fundamental question. What's on my menu? For what would make people desire to dine at this man's table? The Protestant church in America, of all stripes, must grapple with this very question. What's on our menu? What are we serving? Are we actually providing a theological meal that answers society's hunger? Crass politico politicos, wannabe CEOs and aspiring pop stars in the pulpit have driven millions of people out of congregations in recent decades. Yet it seems there's still more to the story. Could it be that people desire a theological menu that is an alternative to, not merely a reflection of, our nation's most pervasive civic faith? People want an alternative to rigid hierarchies born of an all-encompassing social meritocracy. By social meritocracy, I'm referring to a system of social management that categorizes and classifies people according to their presumed skills and abilities. Oh, it's a noble ideal. It's a noble ideal insofar as it champions democratic possibility, the belief that anyone can rise to the highest social, educational, or professional levels by virtue of their intelligent discipline and imagination rather than it being a birthright or by heredity. But as much as the language of meritocracy inspires, it also obscures. It obscures the fortuitous circumstances of birth. It obscures the direct correlation between household income and the mechanisms that we use in this society to measure merit. The requisite private schools, tutors, coaches, and admissions consultants do not come cheap. And it, it obscures the legacy benefit of our hallowed halls of power as our institutions have the uncanny ability, like the mythical figure Narcissus, to fall in love with their own images. Yet most relevant for us gathered here today, the myth of meritocracy obscures the emotional, physical, and psychological toll of its effects on even those of us who are deemed quote-unquote successful. Ruinous 80 to 100 hour work weeks, overscheduled and overburdened youth, and the inordinate pressure for us to measure up to somebody somewhere else. And with such emphasis on individual merit, no wonder civic participation at every educational level has declined over the past 25 years in our nation. A growing amount of research reveals that the more individuals believe in their own merit, the more prone we are to be selfish, less self-critical, and even discriminatory. We don't have time to consider what we owe one another or wrestle with more significant existential questions of life. And as, as, as affiliation has decreased, Diseases of despair such as loneliness, anxiety, depression, and addictions have increased across all socioeconomic categories. We live in a world where people yearn for faith, hope, love, meaning, and purpose. Yet the evidence shows that they are not inclined to dine from a table of Protestant noblesse oblige a table that does not look, feel, or taste very different from the meritocratic menu offered by the larger society. 
Thus, the questions that we, members of the Protestant church writ large in America, must constantly ask is whether we are serving a meal that is distinct. Recall the lessons from the great 20th century theologian and one-time darling of the political establishment, Reinhold Niebuhr, a man who learned the price of cozying up too close to power the hard way. A few years before his death, he warned us that whenever our Christian witness clings too close to any cultural or political establishment, we risk becoming the high priests in the cult of complacency and self-sufficiency. My friends, the gospel invites us all to a banquet where seats are shared and not seized where achievement kneels before altruism, and where the bountiful blessings of life are not trophies to be hoarded, but treasures to be distributed. Our host in this parable projects an alternative vision of a society where the conceptual dividing lines between the first and the last, the margins and the center, the establishment and the excluded are erased and eradicated. This banquet host leverages his resource to make the banquet more open and equitable. Our host seizes this moment to swing open the doors of access and opportunity. Princeton Theological Seminary stands as a beacon, burnishing both the tradition of theological wisdom and the translucence of timely transitions. We are torchbearers of a faith that finds its roots in ancient texts, yet flourishes in the contemporary context. Not merely garden, dark guardians of a privileged past, but as gardeners of a more nourishing future. We can fertilize moral imaginations to harvest alternative social visions grounded in the teachings of a Jewish peasant. The urgency the urgency of our mission is to make the theological table more accessible and our menu more inviting. It's not enough to open the doors. We must go into the highways and byways, extending God's invitation to those historically marginalized and overlooked. The seminary must be an enduring resource to our alums and others throughout the globe. Thoughtful, sober servants who are tending to the wounds of victims of terror and persecution, providing water to those who thirst, and building bridges of peace where others erect boundaries and borders of oppression. We at Princeton Seminary must enhance our menu of offerings to expand and to enrich the table. To be sure, expanding the table will indeed alter us. Yet the diversification of questions, concerns, and spiritual quests that people will invariably bring to our learning community is not a challenge to be feared. It is a treasure to be embraced. The diversification of offerings, whether hybrid degrees, certificates, or stackable credentials, is not an obstacle to be avoided. It is a gift to be extended. J. Ross Stevenson, the second president of Princeton Seminary, declared in his 1916 inaugural message that the design of the seminary did not fix rigid molds for the manufacturer of an unvarying type of minister. In his words, the seminary must endeavor to serve each present age. And my friends, this is my prayer today that we remain steadfast in our institutional purpose and mission to prepare Christian servants for ministries marked by faith, integrity, competence, compassion, and joy. This will remain the same. Yet who we teach and how we teach must always remain an open question for each present age, and this creates the conditions for who we can become. 
an expanded table of possibility insofar as our influence reverberates not just within the halls of academia and tall steeple congregations, but in the hearts and homes of all who hunger for meaning and thirst for justice. So as we, as we move forward to this next influential era for Princeton Seminary, let us be brave enough to look beyond the presumed glories of a privileged past. Let us be bold enough to set our sights on a more inclusive and accessible future. And may we remain both self-critical in our prayers and confident in our purpose that we can allow the love of Christ to expand the realm of our possibility and the contours of our beloved learning community. This is my prayer. This is my prayer. This, my friends, is Princeton Seminary's purpose. And this together is our possibility.
My friends, life is short. Time is filled with swift transition. So we don't have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel this thing called life with us. So let's be swift to love. Let's make haste to be kind. Let's be quick to compliment and slow to criticize. And if you do so, do so constructively. <laughs> love yourself. For loving yourself is a precondition for loving your neighbor. And if we do these things, we might begin to approximate what it means to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before our God. This is our prayer. Amen. This is our purpose. And it's our possibility. Yes. Amen. Amen. Marching, marching up to Zion, that beautiful city of God. We're marching, marching up to Zion, that beautiful city of God. We're marching, up to Zion, that beautiful city of God. Shall you know we're marching, marching up to Zion, that beautiful. Oh, we're marching, marching up to Zion, that beautiful city of God. We're marching, marching up to Zion, that beautiful Come we that love the Lord, and let our joys be known. Join in the song of sweet accord and thus surround the throne. Father God, you know we're marching, marching up to Zion, that beautiful city of God. Child, you know we're marching, marching up to Zion, that beautiful city of God. Let those refuse to sing. Who never knew our God, but children of the heavenly, heavenly King will speak their joy abroad. Child of God, you know we're marching, marching up to Zion, that beautiful city of God. Oh, 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 marching, marching up to Zion, that beautiful. Oh! 